Art has been a mystery and a joy for millions since the beginning of man. Is art meaningful to you, or is it a strange and distant part of our culture? Then let art historian Richard Love and his guests make art come alive. By exploring every avenue of the American art community, Love focuses on its makers and shakers, its traditions and its innovations. You may not always agree, but you will like what you see on American Art Forum. Now here's Richard Love. Have you ever marveled at the innovative and graceful designs of the many examples of Frank Lloyd Wright's work found in the Midwest? Or maybe you wished you knew more about the man and the thoughts behind these designs. So tonight, we'll discuss Wright's Usonian homes from the 1930s. And to help me do this are my guests, Professor James Dennis, owner of the first Herb Jacobs House in Westmoreland, Wisconsin, and Don Kalick, Director of Research and Restoration of the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio Foundation in Oak Park. Gentlemen, it's good to have you both here. We're going to talk about something very unusual, uh, at least to our viewers, perhaps. We're going to talk about the word Usonian and how that special word applies to the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. But before we do that, before we talk about it, I want to uh, pick up a little book here and quote something from the, the very man himself, namely Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I'll get to it here in a second. He said, he said, and I'm quoting, what was the matter with a typical American house? Well, just for an honest beginning, it lied about everything, he said. He said, went on to say, it had no sense of unity at all, nor any such sense of space as should belong to a free people, again, implying America and Americans. He went on to say, it was stuck up in thoughtless fashion. It had no more sense of earth than a modernistic house, and it was stuck up on whatever it happened to be. To take any one of these so-called homes away would have improved the landscape and helped to clear the atmosphere. Now, wasn't he, in, his, in this Usonian ideal that he put forth, wasn't he attempting to do just that, to replace the typical useless home as he saw it, and, 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 and make something very special, very unique, but especially American, perhaps even identified more closely with the USA? Is that true or not true? Is that That's what Usonian's the, about? It certainly is true. It was a very particular kind of house for the average American, belonging to the American soil and the American culture, that would look at home no place else in the world. Mm -hmm. All right, but Usonian, to help me define the term, uh, uh, Jim, do you have a handle on that? Uh, uh, do you know what? What Usonian, its derivatives, does, does it mean USA, as everyone seems to think it does? Is that right? Well, without getting esoteric about it, because the actual source of the term is, is uh, unknown, it uh, was Frank Lloyd Wright's way of referring to uh, what we refer to as the United States. The United we would be Usonians. Meaning it wouldn't necessarily be applicable to the Canadians or the Mexicans or the Puerto Ricans or the Nova Scotians or whomever. So, That's right. Just so, not all North Americans, just American and American culture. All right. Then we have to say, what is Usonian architecture? What, is it, what does it mean? Well, how is it different? What is it? Can you tell me? Well, remember, this was the middle of the 1930s, middle of the Depression. People were poor. There was a crying need for housing. And Frank Lloyd Wright had the answer, which was his Usonian house. So it was low cost, costing less than $5,000 or thereabouts was very simple, unpretentious, sort of eliminating all the things that cost money but don't really contribute to the sense of the house. Yeah, it eliminated a lot of things, didn't it? Uh, we're, we're talking about um, uh, quite a contrast to the Prairie Home style. Uh, to, uh, that, that's a totally different, because an upper class home. We're talking about something that emanated its genesis was found in the midst of the Depression, are we not? Yes, yes. For example, there was no plastering. Everything was finished. There was either brick or wood or glass, basically. And wherever you saw brick on the inside, it was brick on the outside. Wherever you saw wood on the inside, it was wood on the outside. It was an, an integral house. And you did away with plasters and tile setters and, and 
all those trades. Well, why don't we look at the first slide, which will give our viewers some idea as to what Usonian architecture is like. Now, could you explain this, please? This is one a first example, isn't it? Yes, this is of the Herb Jacobs house after it was completed, and it shows the, the garden side of the house. And this was another unique thing about the Usonian houses is that they presented a very private side to the street, and they opened up to the what we call the backyard, except right now had this as a garden, with these wonderful tall glazed doors that would open up, and you would have complete privacy, and the major rooms all focused out there. Now, Don Kalick, you work in the restoration of these kinds of homes, but especially uh, now, uh, you, are, uh, you, are in, you are employed, as it were, by the Home and Studio Foundation, Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio yes, Foundation. Yes. So it is your job to know every aspect of this restoration. But Jim Dennis, you're a professor of art history, and you own one of these homes. It, I, the relationship is there, but how in the world did you get involved with the Herb Jacobs house? Well, I was acquainted with the Herb Jacobs house because of my interest in Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote a little article on Frank Lloyd Wright back Your in the 60s. Interest. And, Your scholarly uh, interest. Your scholarly interest mm -hmm. in American art and Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, concept of what the United States is and what Americans are and what the art should be for these people and uh, the Usonian house was his uh, was his um, was was what was of great interest to me and being in Madison there it was you know um, so the opportunity presented itself you I, purchased a house yes. and now you and Don Kalick have been involved with this uh, restoration process well let's look at another slide of the of uh, the Herb Jacob house now while we're discussing this this looks to be like an old 1936 Ford or something in yeah, Mr. Jacobs there. first car I believe mm -hmm. well why did Herb Jacobs be either so fortunate or unfortunate to have the the first Usonian house this is I am correct in stating that this is the very first u example of Wright's Usonian architecture well, it was not? the first one that was built I uh, see Frank Lloyd Wright in the same year had designed two others that weren't built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Herb Jacobs was the first one that came along mm -hmm. that the idea of actually living in a low-cost house worked for. Frank Lloyd Wright used to say that there, yeah, a lot of people are interested in a $5,000 house, yeah. but they yeah. really wanted a $10,000 yeah. house. But here, here came Mr. Jacobs and said, hey, this is not such a bad idea. I think I'll do it, right? And that, it was, that was what they wanted. It was okay. a very simple and pretentious house. Now, when we say... May I'm I sorry, say you're sure, Jim? the $5,000 house, he had thought, Frank Lloyd Wright had dreamed of building a $5,000 house in spite of the economic changes from the turn of the century. And he designed one, for example, a model for the uh, Ladies' Home Journal in 1906. So he'd been thinking of a $5,000 house, and then the Jacobs went out to him and said, look... They, in a sense, challenged him, you know, to build a $5,000 house. You say you can do it on paper. Now let's see you do it. Yeah. Well, didn't the Nottleman House, which is a later home in Phoenix, didn't that, and even the Boomer House, I think the Nottleman House cost exactly $5,700, including Wright's commission, wasn't it? Wasn't that? I believe that. I'm not... I, it's pretty close this to that. Supposedly, the Herb Jacobs House was supposedly 5500 55. including his yeah. uh, fee. Now what happened to it? Now we're going to look at some slides. You've both been involved in the, in the restoration of this house. And we're going to look at some slides shortly, mm -hmm. which will talk to us about that part. But we have also plans on the construction stages. So first what we want to do is see how the house began. Now we know Mr. Jacobs said, okay, now let's do it. Now we've got to see how it came about. Let's look at the first slide. I, this, this is uh, one of the renderings, is it not? Yes. This, the, one of the unique things about the Usonians was the way that they were put together. For example, the ground was, there was no basement. The ground was just excavated three or four inches, and the heating pipes were laid in a bed of gravel. Now, later we're going to see that, aren't we, in the, re, in the uh, restoration of the bed. We're going to find those uh, in another slide. Right. This, so this was the first radiant heated house. Mm -hmm. and now, are these not some of the, aren't we looking at some of the, uh, on the ground plan, at some of the radiant yes, pipes Yes, you see some of the radiant pipes going in. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at another slide then. Now this is, uh, again... This, this is the concrete slab that's poured over that, and it is scored in a module, in this case two feet by four feet. And the rest of the house is then built upon this module. So it was one of the first modular houses, so, so they to speak. pour a concrete slab and score it as if it were tiled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and of course the heating pipes are in there. Now here's and another... the module is the unit of measurement. Right. right. Exactly. Now here's and another slide showing that grid form. And right? then, then, they, then they erect all the brick work that has to be done. The various piers, the fireplace, and some of the rooms were even encased in brick. With, with typical, typical mortar. Typical brick 
mortar. sand mortar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then and then these modular areas would be would be expanded uh, upon until we came into living spaces. Such yes, as we now, we're, now we see the wood construction going in, the post between the doors, and all these line up on the unit system, on the module. Which and, made the carpenter's work and the mason's work a little easier. Should have been pointed out there are no studs in the house. These ah. are sandwich walls. Ah, that's right. Well, what about three it? thicknesses of boards screwed together, so the walls were very thin, but solid wood. Mm -hmm. Vertical core boards. And then the outside boards, board and battens, he called them, and the inside boards are identical. Hmm. Amazing. Well, this whole subject is amazing, and we're going to, to continue it here after we take a short uh, break. But stay tuned. We'll return and talk more about Frank Lloyd Wright, our Usonian architecture. We're talking about Frank Lloyd Wright architecture, but a special kind. We're talking about the Usonian kind, which was a special idea that Frank Lloyd Wright had uh, which he equated with the American spirit as it applied to a time in American history when funds were kind of low. Uh, one of the greatest examples, certainly the first example, uh, was the Herb Jacobs house. And uh, Professor James Dennis, a professor of art history at the University of Wisconsin, or excuse me, University of Wisconsin at Madison, I should mm -hmm. point out, um, owns this famous home. And uh, of course, Don Kalick, uh, whom you've, we've been talking with here, um, is a member of the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Study Foundation, as a matter of fact, the director there. And we've been talking about just exactly how this famous house is, was constructed, its concept, and, of course, its restoration. Now, um, to, to put it in perspective, we have to say that right now we're seeing only the, uh, the construction uh, Aspects, part, the, right. the, just the paperwork which Mr. Jacobs saw. Mm -hmm. it, must have been, it must have been a heck of an innovative idea to him, too. Well, let's look at another slide that we... Uh, just before we took a break. Uh, oh, now, uh, can you explain this? I thought we had another uh, construction view. What, what is this, Don? Well, I should let... Uh, well, what happened to our construction? <laughs> well, it's gone. There were many drawings for this house. At first, the house was, I, Don didn't mention, but it actually was designed for a lot across the street. So the drawings, there are many drawings, did many drawings, are in reverse of the house as it was designed. But this is the way the house looked when I bought it. So what year was this? This was in December. I bought it in December of 82, 1982. And it was in that condition that you just saw. And it was very overgrown. And we had to dig it out, actually. Cut it out of the wilderness. No kidding. Yeah. You mean it had weeds and vines and vines trees. And trees. You could see the house. Is that right? Covered with uh, a lot of shrubbery and so on. It was just overgrown. And then as we got into the house, looking at it, uh, the structure of it and so on, we discovered a lot of problems, a lot of dry rot. Uh, Just as we see carpen here. Carpenter ants, yes. And uh, primarily the roof was the problem. And the carport, the cantilevered carport, we had to tear down completely, absolutely demolished it. And uh, the slide now shows the reconstruction of the carport pier. We did put a foundation. There were no foundations uh, under the original slab, so but we did put a foundation under that pier. Uh, let me interrupt you a minute. Now, you, it's a slab, and normally that's placed on, gr on a gravel base. Yes, it was on But in this case, grade. you undercut that, dug a, a, a footing, and put a, a footing uh, of poured concrete, I would imagine. For only one pier, and that was the carport oh, pier because it pier. supports the cantilever, a very dramatic cantilever. Ah. And a cantilever is uh, really a one-post structure mm -hmm. based on uh, the tensile strength of steel. But the rest of the uh, or wood, building or is still on a pad. Yes. No, you didn't put a footing under the no. under the outer edge of the building. No. Okay. It was slightly thickened around the edge, I but see. it didn't go down as as normal construction six, three or four eight feet. inches, something like that. Yes, the slab is about six to seven inches thick. I see. In in which the radiant heat pipes. Well we'll see more of that. And it rests primarily on sand. I see. Mm -hmm. But that isn't a criteria packed, for packed building sand. a Usonian house, because what are you going to do if you go into Kankakee County, Illinois, you've got clay. Oh, yes. So you can, the foundations, of course, vary depending on what kind of soils you have and local codes. Exactly. Well, let's look at another slide uh, where the restoration is in prime. Did, did you ever think that this was going to be no, so this, complicated, Jim? No, I didn't. I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> yes, it's probably a good thing you didn't. <laughs> yeah. And how about the dollars? I mean... Oh, uh, it's been... Incredibly expensive. And now you're very rich because you've spent all that dollars and everybody wants to come and see it, right? Yes, yes, of course. Very because you're rich. charging money for people to come. No, you're actually not. You need help in this, don't yes, you? Yes, uh, the key word is debt. Debt. D-E-B-T. -E uh, <laughs> held up by you alone, right? <laughs> That's right. Okay. What are they doing here? 
there they're uh, actually what they're doing is sister beaming, if you'll excuse the expression, putting one by uh, one by tens on either side of the stacked two befores that Don can tell you about. This is a rather peculiar way of uh, building roof joists. Well, why don't you tell us about it? Is well, it some instead kind of, of using process? one single member, as you find in most houses, to act as a beam or a, a roof joist, frankly, I'd write stack three two by fours on top of each other, and the idea was that they would push them up in the center to make them crown a little bit and then spike them together and they would hold this slight crown that would let the water run off the roof. Kind How of much camber, of a crown in, in 12 feet? What are we talking oh, about? Oh, maybe a half inch or an inch. I or see. So well, like very imperceptible to the eye, probably. Oh, yes, yes. Unless you really Just checked it out very carefully. But as I understand, when you went in there, it found, it found out that they weren't indeed spiked together. And I so see. they had gone the other way. The architect said one thing and the builder said another. The builder did something else. I yeah. The primary problem was with the roof, Richard, and the uh, roof had a uh, great accumulation over the years added uh, asphalt ah. and we uh, weighed one square foot of it uh, at the so-called crown of uh, the living room wing and it weighed over 20 pounds. Now when you did this restoration so you took... So this weight was resting down on those poor old stacked two before. Sure and had it been the way Wright designed it it wouldn't it would have been different. It would have been crowned and that weight wouldn't have been probably... Well, so people, people over the years that had it re-roofed well, should I have say, stripped it down. should have stripped it yeah, down instead of keep exactly, adding all that asphalt. Exactly. To it, so. Well, what kind of a roof shingling system was it? Just asphalt? Asphalt. It was flat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Flat. Mm -hmm. Now we have a one membrane, single membrane rubber. What about the rotting of the wood? Did you have problems with that? Did he protect it? So many times in Usonian architecture, his idea was to stay away from anything but the natural oils of the wood, et cetera, et cetera. Did, what, what, what was the case yes, in the you, Herb Jacobs house? But you have to, there's maintenance. Maintenance is extremely important in these houses, and it just hadn't been maintained. Did he not like paint? I mean, he used it in other places. Well, he basically liked the wood to be left as natural as possible. If paint was used, it was just used as an accent. And it cost money. He was attempting to hold it down. Let's look at another slide and see how we go uh, in this restoration process. Well, what you see here is the, uh, is the south end of the living room wing, if you remember the plan at all. And uh, those are beams that we're putting in into the south pier. Uh, and actually, those are flitch plates. That's a term uh, <laughs> that he used. Flitch bait, pl uh, plates, as yes, the workers call them fish plates, but mm -hmm. flitch plates. And actually, they're just sandwiched steel, uh, about a quarter inch steel plate with uh, two by tens or twelves or whatever on either side. And that's so what you see. The wood and the steel act together. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, so. and out of that is the cantilever, was possible. And the cantilever is this projected beam, you know, that has no. Right, support. No support. The steel keeps it from doing this, which wood wants to do over a period of time. We're not going to have any support if we don't cut to our commercial needs, so we're going to take a quick break here, but we'll be right back talking about Frank Lloyd Wright Usonian architecture. Architecture, American architecture, especially the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. That's our topic tonight, and we're discussing it with James Dennis, professor of art history, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and Don Kalick, an architect. Uh, we're specifically talking about the Herb Jacob House, the Herb Jacobs House, the first example of Usonian architecture, or USA kind of architecture. How is it different? Did it, was it the prototype? of Usonian architecture, did it, did it create a style, a, 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 is it the manifestation of something which went on to be, to, to coin, to actually be the coin term of Usonian architecture? Yes, it did. In Wright's work, he went on to design some 300 of them, uh, probably 140, 150 of them actually got built. And he was still doing Usonian houses when he died in 1959. But right in Wisconsin is the prototype, the Herb Jacob House, which you now own and have had restored. I'm saying the quintessential features, all of the salient qualities which were in Usonian architecture, were in this house? Yes, yes. yes. They were simply developed as time went on. Is yes, that correct? Made more elaborate. Uh, if somebody had a lot of money, they got a bigger Usonian. If they didn't have as much money, they got a little Usonian. But they were all essentially the same kind of house. How long did they last? I mean, how long did he continue making these? 
well, up until he died, he was still designing Usonian houses. So really, we're seeing something very specifically American, very specifically Wrightian, and very specifically a pragmatic answer to a need. Yes. Is that true? But one with incredibly innovative and idealistic architectural uh, function. And they were done almost in every state in the Union. I mean, they really spread across the entire United States, from California to um, New Hampshire. So they became, in a way, almost faddish. It, 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 not in the upper class sense of the word, but faddish from the standpoint of need. Well, I think uh, as far as the Usonian houses, he did build uh, approximately 150 of them, but this house also was influential on post-World War II architecture in general and uh, in the houses of uh, our great suburbs. For example, the uh, living dining area became one, so that you had that fluency instead right. of an uh, isolated dining room, and also uh, an open kitchen, and that appears in this house. So that it and the carport. And Frank Lloyd Wright invented the carport. Yes, he and did. Carport. And, but with good thought about the kitchen, for example, where, where such things as the cooking smells would be e exhausted, so they wouldn't yes. fill up the rest of the house. So it wasn't just space, it was the pragmatic oh, yes. Very uh, much quality so. that he needed. Well, he was such a colorful guy. I mean, goodness, you know, so much to be known about Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, do you, don't you think this was kind of a manifestation of his, well, should I say flamboyant, his innovation, his absolute need to, to be so different from everybody else? He, he did have that need, didn't he? Yes, well, he talked about being a radical, but he, said he meant from the root, and he felt like because of his family background and, and so forth that he was really into the heart of the matter. Well, he thought radical root being the same mm -hmm. word, didn't he? Yes. Well, let's yes. look at another slide. We have more slides of the uh, restoration g uh, going on. Uh, th this is one, isn't it? Actually, these are close-ups of the inch and a half uh, steel pipes. Now, these are the original pipes that were under the, uh, under the slab. And they make the heat. And they make the heat. And in early January 1984, I was here in Chicago, as a matter of fact, and uh, one of the pumps stopped. There were two pumps, so one for each wing of the house. One of them stopped. The pipes froze, so I had to replace the pipes, oh, and that's goodness. why the old pipes are there. To tear up the concrete. In, concrete in, in, floor. In, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's look room. at another slide. We have more. And here uh, it is. This is without the floor, you see. Mm-hmm. And the sand, you can see the, you can see the st sand of the... That's uh, the original, uh, that's the original underlayment sand of the, of of the, the foundation. That's right. It. Let's look at another one, and we, I think we're going to see the pipes. These and these are, are the new pipes that have gone in, and these are uh, polybutylene. It's a shell oil um, product. I don't know whether we can mention that or not, but it's used very commonly in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Soviet Union. Not so commonly in the United States yet, but that's, that's the new piping under well, it's the... it's a poly pipe, the black poly pipe, right? It's a, it's a uh, plastic... Are uh, these uh, about an inch ID uh, or... Uh, uh, outer, uh, the, uh, the exterior ID is... Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, that is the exterior uh, mm -hmm. diameter is, is an inch, about seven, right. eight... Uh, and there we also ID. saw the walls with no studs. Uh, uh, and well, here the, the sandwich. Now this right. is this is the colorundum, the color that's being put into the uh, concrete. It's uh, the red color that he liked to use, a kind of terracotta color. Now is the concrete uh, brush finish, or just exactly how did they do that? Usually it was very smooth, and I they would see. wax it, so it, it became almost like a, a kind of marble after a number of waxings. And right. because it was always warm, it would made a beautiful oh, low cost yeah, floor. Oh yeah, kept the wax just in a mm -hmm. high gloss, I suppose. And, Looking very, very well. And here, this is a concrete. That was a concrete <coughs> that finisher. That was the one. And this is outside now, where you just saw the the uh, worker. And this is the outside. And these are the new uh, window doors of the living area that look out over the dining, so or over the over the garden. Again, there's an open, spacious quality, bringing the outside inside. That's part of the Usonian concept mm -hmm. too. Uh, and there, there were passive solar. Freedom. These these windows in the winter time allowed the southern sun to shine in and, and literally warm the house during the day on a sunny day. Which so, is doing today. So once again, yeah, he was ahead of his today. time. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and of course that set uh, stylistically a trend as well as again the pragmatic side. I think that's. In my opinion, that's one of the greatest things that Wright did. He was not only an idealist in terms of design and the spatial quality with which he made living easy and comfortable, but also from the pragmatic side. I mean, well, he, he, made made the prag he made the pragmatic uh, poetic. Yes, he did, didn't he? He certainly did. And we keep talking about him, and rightly and justifiably we should, but, but it's, it's amazing to me that uh, an, an artist, an architecture, an architect so great as Frank Lloyd Wright could have the first Usonian piece of architecture growing up in weeds. How did you happen to, 
to, to, to, to come across this? I mean, something well, I knew the house, about? but uh, it was very difficult to see. And one day I drove around the corner and saw that it was for sale. No one was living there? Oh, yeah, somebody was living oh. there. But uh, the house was really essentially concealed behind all of the growth. So whom did, did, you, did you know, Don, and you two f got together that way, or how did this... Well, I just jumped into it, and then Don and I got together. <laughs> financially, later. you mean? Yeah, financially. I see. Because I was very excited because of the houses, the, the importance, the art historical importance of the house, and I wanted to save it. Well, now you own a piece of it, oh, or yeah. it. Uh, tell us something about the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio Foundation. Uh, can, you, can you give us some idea? How do you work with, it's not just one home, you're concerned with the whole application of Usonian architecture. Well, basically now what we're doing is restoring Frank Lloyd Wright's very first home in Oak Park that he built in 1889 and his studio, which he built in 1895, uh, to the condition that they were when Frank Lloyd Wright lived and worked there. Mm -hmm. And in 1911, he went up to Wisconsin to build his second home, Taliesin, which he lived in all of his life. So that the, the home and studio that I work with really is where the, the prairie house, or his very first expression of the American house, originated. Could you quickly, quickly, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but could you quickly compare and contrast, if you would, I'm asking a tough question, the prairie home style. And, and the Usonian. The and the Usonian. Maybe we could put the... Well, shall we put on last, another slide? Yeah, the last, the way, I think what we, it looks like now, I think if we, possible. Yeah, why don't maybe we see the, what it looks like after it's been restored? Yeah. Or, exactly. Oh, well, there it is now. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the way it is now. Well, this is... With the black the stain extracted. It was, somebody had painted black stain into the uh, exterior. We and that did away with the horizontal emphasis. Is this the last slide? We've only got a minute. This is fine. This is fine. And that okay. shows the horizontal emphasis. With right. snow. Typical for Wisconsin. That's right. the way it is yes. today. I just took that slide uh, last week. Did you really? So, <laughs> are you ever inviting anyone to see your beautiful Usonian architecture? Yes, it is architecture. Open for visitors. As people may come. And they only have to pay twenty thousand dollars a visit, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure you've in, you've incurred a tremendous debt with that, and and I'm sure people will be fascinated to contact you if they ever should want to see it mm -hmm. at the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, it's it's been absolutely great talking about this, but quickly, in just a word, Don, I'm going to put you on the spot. What's the difference between Usonian? we only got a couple of seconds. Usonian well, the, the basic principles were the same, but in the Usonian house, they were much simpler, much lo more low cost, so that they'd be able to be built by a, a greater number of people. They're usually one story, uh, no basement, or a very minimal basement, and very built very close to the ground, whereas the prairie houses were for upper middle class, much more elaborate art glass. And okay. Well, great. Once again, I say, gentlemen, it's been just wonderful having you, and, and I think our viewers have learned something about Usonian architecture. Thank you very much for being my guest. Well, that's it for this evening, but uh, American Art Forum will return next Saturday night, and we hope to see you then. I'm Richard Love, inviting you to tune in again then. See you.